Hello, everyone. Welcome to another No Kid Hungry Back to School Meal Service webinar. This is one of many webinars in our Back to School Meal Service series. This one is on how out of school time providers are supporting schools and communities. Next slide, Chelsea. So before we really kick it off, I wanna go over some housekeeping. This is a 60 minute webinar. We are being recorded. That means this webinar will be available on the Center for Best Practices website in just a few days. Uh, and you will be getting a recording of the webinar emailed to all participants who registered for this webinar. Also, you can ask questions anytime during the webinar via the Q&A box. And if you're not familiar with Zoom webinars, which you probably have uh, been on many at this point um, in time, but if you scroll your cursor down to the bottom of the Zoom screen, you should see several icons. There should be a Q&A box that's right next to the chat box. Stay on that Q&A box. That will enable you to ask questions to us, um, myself, the speakers, at any point in time during the webinar. We will do our best to answer them in real time if we can. I have allotted uh, plenty of time at the end of the webinar for a question and answer session as well, but please know that you have that option at any point in time during the webinar. Next slide, Chelsea. Okay. So on the agenda today, I will kick us off with some introductions. I will introduce myself and our speakers. I'll talk a little bit about No Kid Hungry's emergency response efforts. Uh, and then I'll pass the mic to our amazing speakers and that will be the bulk of the webinar today. And then like I said, we'll have um, enough time at the end for any live Q&A um, question and answer sessions that we need. Next slide, Chelsea. All right, so hi everyone, I'm Summer Kriegshauser. I'm a senior program manager here at No Kid Hungry. I will be your moderator today, and I will also be walking you through uh, No Kid Hungry's emergency response efforts. We have a fabulous lineup of speakers today, so I'm so pleased you're joining us. First up, we will have Amanda Schmitz, the Social Responsibility and Community Outreach Director and the year-round food facilitator for the Monroe Family YMCA in Michigan. We also have Sherry Maxwell, Chief Operating Officer of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Albany, located in Georgia. And then we have Krista DeBoer, Nutrition Program Director at Youth Prize in Minnesota. Um, and our speakers will be talking about their respective organizations, how they're operating, um, how they are adapting to COVID, how the waivers are affecting them. So there's a lot of good information yet to come. Next slide. So a little bit about No Get Hungry. Hopefully you know who we are, but if you don't, we are an organization dedicated to ending childhood hunger, and we do it by increasing access to the child nutrition programs. We feel that these programs are excellent. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So we really work hard through our advocacy efforts, um, through uh, technical assistance, through our granting to increase access. Next slide. And we know this year in particular has been very hard for families. The economic impact of the coronavirus has been massive across the country. And so we know that one in four kids this year could face hunger because of the pandemic. Next slide. So the um, No Kid Hungry has really been in coronavirus emergency response mode for many months. Um, since schools started closing in March, No Kid Hungry has reacted very quickly to ensure that children have that continued access to those critical food resources that we know are a lifeline for kids and families. We've done that uh, through a multi-pronged approach. We've given out millions of dollars in emergency grants across the country to schools, um, community organizations, nonprofit partners. We've also provided technical assistance um, to operate these programs or help navigate this unprecedented time. We also have done a lot of advocacy work around um, supporting the child nutrition programs and bolstering SNAP. We've also increased awareness about the importance of the child nutrition programs. I mean, we, we know how critical they are always, but especially now, um, because like I said, of the eco economic impact. And I wanna pause for a second and just mention um, two advocacy items. Um, if you don't already know, you probably know this, but um, 
I just wanted to mention the continuing resolution that the House of Representatives passed. Uh, it's fully expected to pass in the Senate, but this has two very important uh, parts to it. It grants USDA the authority to extend waivers through September 2021, that's huge. It also appropriates funding to fund any waiver extensions. So that's gigantic if you don't know that. Um, the other thing is that there is a new CACFP at-risk eligibility waiver, wanting to highlight that. This is effective through, uh, through December, excuse me, and it is important because it aligns with the summer meals waiver. So this means if a site is eligible to serve meals via the summer waiver, summer meals waivers, that site should also be able to serve via CACFP at risk. So wanted to highlight two things um, you may or may not know, but um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, so I want to also let you know, we would love to hear from you. Um, we want your stories, we want your experiences. If you have any questions, um, that could be questions about waivers, questions, that, operational questions about how to operate certain programs, um, the need for guidance, if you're seeking that, please send us everything you got. Um, this is the email, best practices at strength.org. Uh, this helps us do our job better because then we know with what information you are needing, what guidance you are needing. And also we love to hear your stories. If you have troubleshooting best practices, work around best practices, we want to hear how you are doing um, amidst this unprecedented time. So please send us uh, anything you got. Next slide. And then before I pass this off to um, our first speaker, I just want to put a plug in for our Center for Best Practices website. We have a, an expansive website with hundreds of resources, totally free. Um, but since COVID uh, hit, we have created several coronavirus specific resources. I've hyperlinked the, um, the URL here. Uh, but as you can see, this is just a screenshot of our website. Um, it shows we have a separate emergency response and back to school section. In, the, in these sections, you will find information about waivers, how they affect the child meals programs, how you can um, implement the child meals programs amidst the waivers, um, a back to school toolkit so you can help think through how to operationalize these programs, so many things. So I highly recommend you check out that section of our website. Uh, next slide, Chelsea. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it to our first speaker, Amanda. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Summer. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share what um, the Mineral Family YMCA is doing. And I'm hoping that um, the attendees are able to glean some best practices that we've learned throughout the, the pandemic. And um, so with that, um, Chelsea, if you don't mind advancing to the next slide. Um, so I, I think it's important to first just give a, a snapshot of, of the community that um, I'm representing and the, um, just where my why is, where my why is located. And so we are in Michigan and um, we are a rural community with a population of about 150,000. Um, the food insecurity rate, now this rate was actually pre-COVID, um, was about 10.5%. Um, and and so we actually participate at our why we participate in a multitude of food programs anti-hunger efforts are just a passion of ours here i work with the phenomenal anti-hunger team and uh, we really just uh, value and see the importance in ensuring that that all kids are fed and even beyond that um, our program is a self prep sponsor so we sponsor our own cacfp and sfsp programs um, and we have some some priority focuses as well. So we 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 tend to focus on weekend feeding, teen feeding, and more more, more recently, um, adult meals. Um, we really we again we understand the importance of feeding kids, but we really like to take a holistic approach in our community to ensure that everyone has opportunity um, to equitable, healthy meals. Um, and then I just um, I did include on the slide as well just a. Um, a little bit of comparison of um, 2019, which was obviously pre-pandemic compared to um, the, me the meal served um, to date in 2020. Um, obviously there is a significant jump. Now, while the pandemic is a very unfortunate situation, um, I 
tend to look for the silver lining and it really has offered us, um, we were well positioned to take on the opportunity to, to really just um, to make sure that we're reaching people where they are. Um, next slide, Chelsea, please. Um, so we, um, my, my CEO often, often mentions that we were really well positioned um, prior to prior to the pandemic even um, one of the one of our strengths here I feel like in Monroe is that we've fostered some very strong community partners and so we have a partnership we don't have a location in our facility to have a kitchen so we actually rent kitchen space from a local church to be able to prepare all of our all of our meals and then we work with our our um, local um, food pantry to to be our major food vendor. Um, we really feel strongly about investing back into our community and working um, as partners instead of siloed. So that has, has boded well for us, honestly. And then we do have some major sponsors for our program. And then in addition to sponsorship, we are also the food vendor for our district's Head Start program as well. Um, so our community sites include, we really try to be innovative um, to place sites in, in areas of need where that are the highest risk and so that again, all, all kids have that equitable access. So we, we have a lot of our community sites, our school districts, even um, after school, which I'll get into a little bit more, um, mobile home communities have been, have been really benefited from our services, local churches, um, community centers. We, during the pandemic, we partnered with um, and continue to partner with three local shelters uh, to ensure that those families have meals as well. And then we are we're we're partnering with uh, our local municipality. Um, our fire department is actually one of our sites. It's one of our most successful sites. And then I also listed on this slide uh, be, because of those strong partnerships, we've been able to to secure some some support dollars to ensure sustainability of the program. Um, we we all know that the sustainability is incredibly important or we're not able to see the work through so i think because of our stellar reputation with our community partners and just with our work in the community we've been able to definitely some, secure some phenomenal financial partners as well next slide um one of the the um again, one of our focuses is ensuring that we're not duplicating services. We know that the schools are providing food and we definitely appreciate that because we are a nonprofit organization and we only have so much capacity. Uh, that said, we work alongside the largest school district in the county to ensure that we are a complement of interest rather than a conflict or duplicating services. So for example, um, we pivoted immediately um, on March 16th, that's when our local schools closed and um, one of our first steps was to contact the school district to find out what their, their food plan was so that we could ensure that we weren't duplicating that, but rather complementing that. So where are those sites that we could fill those gaps? Um, the schools were serving breakfast and lunch at the time, so, so we decided to focus on supper service and snack service. Um, and so again, it, the, it, what that did was allowed us, when we were working in tandem, it allowed us to ensure more kids had access to healthy meals um, because we weren't duplicating. Um, we had already had a rather strong partnership with our school district. Um, in 2019, we assumed the responsibility of CACFP sponsorship for the school district, um, and that expanded into sponsorship for SFSP during the summer of 2020. Um, I, I'm really proud of that, and that's it's um, something that we that we tend to. Um, just take ownership of because it's not usually the case for a nonprofit to to have that type of relationship with their local school district. I think a more common theme is for the school district to sponsor the nonprofit. Um, my information will be at the end of these slides and I'm more than happy to to have um, offline conversations if folks are are interested in p potentially um, leading those conversations with their school district. Um, and we also, again, um, communication is important and we wanted to make sure that we weren't duplicating any services. So we were also um, meeting by phone with our local school district, the food bank and um, the city uh, weekly just to ensure that everyone was, was certain of what everybody else was doing to make sure that we were complementing each other. Next slide. 
Um, the benefits of the USDA waivers have been incredibly helpful for us. We, I will say that we would not be able to serve in the capacity that we're serving had it not been for these waivers being extended. Um, so first of all, the non-congregate, the parent pickup and the multiple meal waivers have allowed more meals to be distributed. Um, because sometimes still, even I feel like sometimes we feel like we're through this pandemic, but we, we know the reality is unfortunately we aren't. And so we still are speaking to families. I had a testimonial just last week of a family who is still hesitant to, to allow her children to participate in social activities. So um, the fact that we're able to offer meals that don't need to be consumed on site, that the parents can pick up, and that we can give multiple days has been really beneficial to the families in our community. Uh, beyond that, the SFSP expansion waiver um, has allowed seamless meal service um, so that our community um, wasn't confused. I think that we, it really helped us streamline the information and our services that our families that we've become acclimated with and who are comfortable with us and who we've built trust with, um, we've been able to continue um, seamlessly through and then they don't even know anything's happening behind the scenes. So, and, and I think it is important to point out that the higher reimbursement rate has also been incredibly helpful to help support our sustainability. And then the area eligibility waiver has allowed us to establish sites and areas that may be more affluent, but where there might be some pockets of poverty or some at-risk areas. So um, all that to say, we are incredibly beneficial. Um, we've, we've benefited from these, the waivers, and I did put on the slide a shameless plug um, to be sure to advocate for the expansion of that SFSP expansion waiver um, through June 30th of 2021. I feel like as nonprofit organizations that it certainly will be beneficial to our organizations as well as our community. Next slide. Um, so this is the testimonial that I, we just heard last week from a, from a community parent that I have six children and appreciate that the Y brings meals to us. I don't like to take my kids out in public right now and this helps prevent exposure. So it really, I love parent testimonials and I just really love being reminded why we do this work. It is, it is tireless and it is never ending, but it definitely is impactful. And, and that's why it's so important for us here in Monroe. Next slide. And so I just um, want to just take one, one uh, minute of your time just to thank all of the organizations that are on the call right now and just thank you for making a change. Again, this work is um, not for the faint of heart, quite honestly. And, and so um, in true YMCA fashion, I would like to end with a, with a quote. Um, each one of us can make a difference. Together, we can make a change. And I really feel like as a nation, that is what we are doing is we are making an incredibly important change in people's lives during a time that is so, so in question. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Sherry, before I hand it off to you, just a reminder to folks to use that Q&A uh, icon um, and send us your questions. Uh, but Sherry, take it away. All right, so hi, I'm Sherry Maxwell. I'm Chief Operating Officer of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Albany, Georgia. And uh, we are a food desert. Um, so according to any source you look at, uh, we have the highest food insecurity rate of all of our 159 counties. Um, and among children, we have about a 28% food insecurity rate. So um, I'm sure you understand why this is so important to us and, and why we have to get it right. Um, so when you add to that uh, the COVID-19 related unemployment, um, it just adds insult, insult to injury. Um, further, uh, over the past couple of years, we had um, several grocery stores close in the underserved areas. So people are buying their groceries from convenience stores and from um, like Dollar General, um, which you know they have a high amount of processed food. So uh, we as a community, not just Boys and Girls Club, um, but 
um, as a community have decided to um, tackle this issue. And I have some logos on my screen, but I wouldn't have any room for words if I added all of them, of all the people who have helped us do this. So um, what I wanna talk to you about is how we support communities and schools and uh, how we established partnerships and how we navigated the waiver situation. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so pre-COVID, um, we are a CACFP sponsor for our own sites. Uh, so right now we have seven sites um, under our sponsorship, um, but our provider, our food service management company is the school system. Um, which is of a great benefit to us because we don't have to worry about meal patterns. We don't worry about menus. We don't worry about those things because in our area, they are certainly the expert. And while we uh, do get a lot of training from CACFP um, and we are versed on that, it, it takes one of the worries away from us. Um, so that's during our after school program because we are an at risk after school um, organization. So um, for our summer feeding program, af after the after school program ends, uh, we pivot to the school system and they provide our summer feeding program. So as you can see, we are closely knit with our uh, school system. And then our other two sites, which are in uh, two separate counties, um, the CACFP and summer feeding program is sponsored by Second Harvest. Um, we are also a food pantry. Uh, so when we recognize that our youth are particularly insecure or um, have voice to us that they are, we send food with them, home with them over the weekend. So um, I just want to give you an example, um, as Amanda did, of pre-COVID and after COVID. So in pre-COVID, we served 60,000 meals in our after-school program, and we served 30, 000, an additional 30,000 in our summer feeding program. Next slide, please. Okay. And then we had COVID-19. So Albany, Georgia was one of the first coronavirus hotspots in Georgia uh, due to a large funeral that they had and it was on a Saturday and then people went to church. And um, so the trend was trending upward uh, significantly uh, more than other places per capita. Uh, so of course, the health department and local officials um, had a shelter in place way before the nation sheltered in place. And so we closed our clubs on March the 13th. Uh, and then the Darty County school system told us that they would no longer be able to support our CACFP program because they would be delivering meals uh, to the community um, through a bus route. So they would go to certain bus stops and they would drop off meals for people who were uh, located in that um, vicinity. And we worried. Uh, we worried that our kids were latchkey kids and their parents were actually gone to work. So they wouldn't have any way to get to the bus stop or they would be unsafe in traveling to the bus stop. We worried a lot. And so um, we decided that we were hearing about waivers. We weren't sure how to implement them. We weren't sure what they meant to us, but we knew that we would have to continue to provide enrichment programs. And we also used our enrichment programs to check on our kids. So uh, we started um, several programs. E-Club Live was just a replica of what would normally happen in person in the club. And then we had E-Club hub, which was pre-recorded uh, video types of things uh, and TikTok challenges and those kinds of things. And then we had eClub to You, which were um, activity packets, uh, mostly STEM related, that anybody could access anytime. And they could do STEM projects with their parents or, without, or, or by themselves. And next slide, please. Um, we did uh, virtual college tours. We had Duke, Yale, Stanford, University of Alabama, University of Georgia virtual career fairs where we had Condoleezza Rice and others. And then we started to think about our kids' social and emotional uh, well-being as well as the food insecurity issue. And so we started to have quarantine parties and no, that's not a misspelling, it's a play on words. And so you're saying to yourself, so what does all that have to do with food? Um, it allowed us to stay in constant contact 
constant contact with our members. So we would know when they needed food or we would know when they needed emotional support if we were talking to them regularly. We didn't know at the time um, that the in order to continue CACFP, we needed to provide enrichment. So this was free. It was open to the public and we had people as far away as Germany and Spain um, joining in on our sessions. So I think our highest in the regular sessions was probably 9,000. We're a small rural community, Boys and Girls Club. We're not big. There are probably 80,000 people in Albany total in all of the counties. And so we also knew that we were not in a congregated setting. Uh, and that was one of the requirements pre-rate waiver. And the school system wasn't providing us our normal food the way they had. So we were like, oh my goodness. So then uh, we got the newsletter or the email or the update from uh, Georgia Decal um, that said, hey, we've got national waivers. And let me tell you what they mean, uh, which uh, actually was a godsend in a way, uh, but as Amanda said, this is not for the faint of heart. And so to understand the waivers and how to comply uh, is difficult, uh, has been difficult, but we've uh, certainly gotten past that. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so what we decided that we would do, we were not going to let the fact that um, Dirty County School System was doing its bus route thing and uh, they had an inability to provide us with um, our regular supper, uh, which was what we served in our after school program. Um, so I called up the food bank and said, hey, uh, we uh, want to partner with you. If you will provide us food, we will sort it, we will distribute, we will manage the volunteers, and you can do it from our site. And they said, yes, thank you. And so we would deliver 350 boxes of food uh, per day. Um, I'm sorry, per week uh, to our members and the community. Um, and these are unreimbursable uh, meals. So we're not reimbursed for the time, not reimbursed for any food. We just know that Albany it has the highest food insecurity rate ever and that we had to feed our kids. We could not let them go hungry. And so uh, time passes, we take training, we get training and we um, get four national waivers, the mealtime waiver, uh, which said we didn't have to uh, feed our kids at the same time. Usually, you know, you have to do it within the time you say you're going to do it on your application for CACFP. Um, so we got that waiver and then an uncongregated setting waiver was the lifesaver for us um, because we were already doing virtual. Um, we continue, as you'll see, we're open in person, but we still continue to stream from the clubs. Um, and in case we have parents who don't feel comfortable um, coming into the clubs, and of course, the, the, the monitoring and the parent pickup uh, waivers have been life-saving for us. Next slide, please. So these are just pictures of food distribution, and I, I have to tell you all a quick funny story. So the cars are on in the background there. So our parking lot is huge, right? So the cars went from our parking lot all the way to the street that you turn in, and then over to the next street. We caused such a traffic problem that the police came. <laughs> then we just recruited them to manage traffic for us during our, our food distributions. Um, we decided also that our reach wasn't great enough. Uh, while we did have humongous numbers of people coming to get the food boxes, um, we needed a way to transport food to other places. Like we wanted to go into the housing projects and deliver food to uh, people there who uh, needed it. And so we reached out to another one of our uh, partners, Peach State Health Plan, and, and told them about our problem. And so they bought us the food service van that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we have similar missions. I mean, um, healthy lifestyles is one of our core elements and it is uh, also in their mission. So uh, we were aligned in that way. Next slide, please. Okay, so now what? So um, we developed a 32 point protocol or emergency plan that would allow us to open in a manner that was safe for our staff, our volunteers and our kids. And so we went to our board of directors and said, look, we want to reopen and here's how we're going to do it safely. 
Um, we will limit capacity. We have human mungus cavernous buildings, but uh, we will limit it to the number that we can keep six feet apart. We'll provide PPE. Uh, we'll have hand sanitizer. We'll do all these things. We'll check temperatures and we'll do all these things if you will allow us this trial opening. And this was uh, pretty early in the game. Um, so we did. It's summer. So uh, as I told you in an earlier slide, uh, Dirty County School System provides our summer feeding program. And I also told you that they were over capacity. So I went, oh my God, what are we gonna do about food? We're open, but we still gotta feed people, right? And so um, I called them up again and I said, look, how about we become a stop on your bus route? Uh, so when you're putting food out in the community, why well, don't just stop by our place, we'll take the food, we'll take rosters, we'll do whatever you need us to do uh, to ensure that our kids get be fed this summer. And they said, I never thought of that. Of course we will. So we became a stop on the school bus stop. Shortly after that, the um, schools announced that the first nine weeks would be 100% virtual. So we're like, yeah, lions and tigers and bears, what up next? I mean, it's been continually changing, which uh, we've become pretty nimble at uh, taking care of things on the spur of the moment. And so we had heard from our parents and our children that uh, virtual learning was not something that they were equipped to deal with. So they didn't know anything about that new math and uh, they weren't really as computer literate as they should have been and they worried that their kids would fall behind. And so they asked us if we would open all day. And so we created a virtual learning program um, where we would open all day long uh, and the kids would come to our site to have a safe place to go to school. Uh, so remember, we're getting uh, breakfast and lunch from the school system. And because we're doing virtual school, the kids are technically in school. And so that would be done under the school lunch program and certainly not reimbursable by CACFP. And because we are so co uh, closely connected, I mean, we knew that. And so we just want to make sure that the kids get fit, okay? When the kids get out of school, 2.30, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, depending on what grade they are in, they are then in the after-school program and we provide them supper. So they are getting um, three meals a day uh, between all of us. Um, the other thing I told you is that we continue to stream. So not only are we providing meals to the people who are now in a congregate setting with us, um, we are also providing meals to those who um, participate in our virtual enrichment program. So um, they get the same enrichment as kids in the clubs because we're actually streaming from the clubs. Um, so DCSS uh, resumed our food, uh, our feeding program for CACFP. And uh, most recently, we added a final two sites to CACFP. So we're serving about 300 meals a day in the clubs and we're ramping up to get to 540 a day. Um, and uh, that does not include the school systems meals and it doesn't include the meals we deliver because we track those separately. Um, so we provide a attendance roster for the CACFP meals, as you all know. And then for the meals that we um, deliver to people who are getting on our enrichment programs virtually, we track them just by, uh, we got consent forms um, because of confidentiality and other things, and we just check them off. Um, so that number is only the CACFP number. Okay, next slide. So, um, we would love, and we've heard already, so it made me incredibly happy to hear that things have been extended to September 2021, uh, because we would uh, love for the waivers to continue until the pandemic is over, a vaccine has been deployed and effective, um, because we know that uh, people need us. Um, so I will also leave you guys with the quote. Um, so my CEO uh, says regularly, if you see a turtle on the top of a fence post, know that he did not get there by himself. He had help. 
And so we didn't get where we are by ourselves. Uh, we absolutely had help. I mean, um, one of, I told you our core element is healthy lifestyle. We have doctors from Phoebe, essential workers who are coming to our clubs to teach uh, our kids about zucchini and how to make a, a nutritious meal using vegetables that many of them have never heard of. So um, the program works, uh, we're getting there and I appreciate your time. I'll take it. If you have any questions for me, let me know. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, and that's a good plug for our Q&A box. If you want to send questions directly to Sherry, please do. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. I'm adding that to my everyday lexicon. Thank you, Sherry. Um, all right. Krista, I'm passing it off to you. Thank you so much. And I want to thank uh, Sherry and Amanda for presenting. It's been amazing just to hear both of you speak about your programs and just to see the alignment across all of our states and how we're doing things. So I'm very grateful to be on this today. Um, I'm Krista DeBoer. I'm the Nutrition Program Director for Youth Prize. We're based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, we may not be as known as maybe a YMCA or Boys and, Girl, or Boys and Girls Club. So I wanted to present that Youth Prize is a philanthropic organization that facilitates and promotes grant making and support programs such as our nutrition program to forward economic justice and racial equity with and for young people within Minnesota. So much of our work is very much guided by the youth in our communities, the youth within our state and their needs specifically. Um, we really like to be their advocate, but also just provide them space to share what they need and what they see fit for their situations at hand. Um, while Youth Prize has been around for nearly 10 years, our nutrition program started in 2015. Uh, we started off as a single sponsor uh, for a local rec center. Um, and since then, we've grown to over 80 locations cumulatively um, across five counties. Um, we are an unaffiliated multi-site sponsor through CACFP at risk, as well as the um, SFSP. Um, throughout the state of Minnesota only. Um, many of our community partners are libraries, rec centers, community centers, youth serving organizations, um, charter schools, and places of religious worship. Um, so we really try to make sure that our programs are adaptable to multiple, multiple facets of locations of who, whoever needs these meals that we can try to pick a mold that's best gonna get those meals to them. Um, our first year alone, we thought we were going to get to 20 locations and we only were able to get to 10, but we kept surpassing um, our goals. In January of this year, we served our 1 millionth meal, which was a really big feat for us. Um, we worked so hard over the last few years as an unaffiliated sponsor in the state to expand on what we're doing and where to process that. Um, but in the times of COVID, by the end of September, we'll have reached 2 million meals distributed. Um, so just to let that sit of, it took us five years to reach a million meals in our five county area, and now it's going to be hitting two million meals any day now. Um, the need has been so, so heavy in our community. Um, much of that response that we've been able to process has been in coordination with our local city agencies and school districts. Um, one that I'll really focus on during this presentation is our, our, com our combined partnership with the City of St. Paul um, and the St. Paul Public Schools. Um, much of our response prior, or much of our operations prior to COVID were after school meals, um, general summer operations. We almost always serve close to 60 to 70 locations in the summer during the school year. It was probably like 30 to 40 on average. Um, some of them transferring between the two, but as soon as COVID hit in March, um, many of our sites shut down for a week and then we were very thankful to get the waivers distributed because by April, um, a small number, I think we started off with eight or nine sites were able to immediately start back up and, and help with that redistribution of meals. Um, and so it was really important for those waivers to come through in that non-congregate um, in the meal pattern waivers, in the parent pickup, that's become such a huge entity in how we process so many meals at our locations. Um, so I really wanted to break down more of how we operate with schools specifically. So I'll go into that now. Slide, please. So a big fraction of what we've done is we looked at mapping service zones. So like I stated, I'm, I'm going to kind of focus on the city of St. Paul, the Parks and Rec Department, and the St. Paul Public School District. Um, we really tried 
we really worked from the beginning of how can we best coordinate our efforts? How can we all have the same agenda and really see where we're best fit in each community to ensure the meals are distributed to everyone that needs them? Um, as it's already been stated, the need went up exponentially once COVID hit and once people started getting laid off or um, getting furloughed, we just kept seeing these numbers increase. Um, so what we really tried to do was calculate the quantities of meals needed within each city or within each area or district. So within St. Paul, we really wanted to examine who could provide those. Is it a school distribution? Do, um, does youth prize locations need to do that? What's the best, what's the best route to do that? And once we knew how many meals the school could distribute, we were seeing that there were still going to be approximately 60,000 youth and families that were not going to be reached with that capacity. Um, and so we really wanted to work in that structure and say, like, how can we supplement that? How can Youth Prize, our vendors, um, our uh, rec centers, our community locations, how can we supplement that need within the city of St. Paul? So we really worked on mapping out the locations for school distributions, as well as what sites we had available that could operate with their own staff, as most of our sites have their own staffing, and then our team at Youth Prize trains them, operates it, and then takes care of all the administrative effort that goes into these programs to stay manageable. So we did all that training for those sites, for any, anybody that was gonna help with the distribution. So with the schools, they had their bus stops all around, all around St. Paul, as well as their school locations that were handing out in parking lots. And then with Youth Prize, we really wanted to hone in on the recreation centers and youth sites in St. Paul that we knew either A, had the capacity, or B, had the staffing that could manage a multi-hour distribution zone. Um, and then three, we wanted to figure out what meals each entity, whether it be school or youth prize, could provide and when. So we really wanted to break that down. Um, starting, and I think it was about middle of April, because it took us a couple weeks to get our bearings and to understand our new situation and how to document and how to still keep in in some form of compliance as we're operating in a pandemic, we're all still so stressed. Um, I honestly don't know if I slept much those first few weeks and I, I feel like that might be a pretty uniform feeling. Um, it was very intense. And so um, once we got about 13 sites up and running, eight of those were our recreation centers within St. Paul. And we were able to train all of them on the updated protocols um, on their PPE that they needed to use and follow, on the social distancing cues, on getting them tents or additional equipment to ensure that they could take in all these additional all the additional capacity. Um, and I can I'll get to a chart here in a second to kind of show some of that. Um, but many of the recreation centers were serving two days a week, so all of our sites were offered seven day bundles, which allowed them to serve two meals in each bundle. Um, so in one bundle, say they're serving supper and snack, they'd have seven days worth of supper and seven days worth of snack, and each site would coordinate with the community to pick a day to come pick up their bundle each week. So that way it wasn't being flooded drastically on one specific day, and that the, there wasn't so many hours that the staff had to coordinate, um, but we were able to keep it in a confined window to keep the protocol safe and to keep everyone within an operating zone that was comfortable, um, as it can be in those situations. So a lot of our sites served on Tuesdays or Thursdays or Wednesdays and Fridays, um, primarily because we work with a third party vendor, CKC Good Food, and a lot of their charter schools that they were helping distribute with were, were being distributed on Mondays. Um, so we worked with our city, we worked with the school, and then we also had to work with our vendor to navigate, okay, when and where can we get this food out? and really coordinating what days of the week the food was coming from where. Um, and we wanted to make sure it was an accessible time zone. So most of our sites for rec centers and community locations distributed food from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, across most of our communities, that was a window that parents felt comfortable coming to those areas to pick, that or to pick up those bundles. Um, oh, slide. <laughs> So how do you prevent that double dipping scenario? This is something that we really wanted to make sure that we had an understanding of. The last thing you want is to be serving thousands of meals a week and then have a bunch of them disallowed or not be able to claim them. Um, as you know, the others had, had talked about, the sustainability of this program is very integral. And so we wanted to make sure that we covered all of our bases. And so the first thing that we really looked at between um, the schools and ourselves is what meal choices were we going to provide? 
So the majority of our rec centers that we worked with served supper and snack because the school districts were serving breakfast and lunch. And what we looked at with our state and with the, um, with the school districts is, okay, if school districts are op operating SFSP because you know they can't be in the schools, all the schools were shut down, we can still operate that quote unquote after school zone um, to ensure that there's those meals available. So we really tried to coordinate in that space during the school year um, and have opposite meal options available. And then once, um, once summer was over, which <laughs> I don't know if it's ever going to end at this point, but as we're transitioning back into school, it's still something that we have to consider of what are the schools serving, what can we serve when and where. So as these waivers are extended, it's, a really, it's really allowing additional flexibility in our partnerships with the schools um, and with the cities that we're working within. Um, but another major aspect of the preventing the double dipping was the school's capacity. So right off the bat, we knew that spring breaks were coming. We knew that there were going to be some no school days and schools were like, well, how are we going to work within that operation? How are we going to serve on those days? And we don't think we have the capacity because they're already operating at a much higher capacity of distribution than what they were accustomed to. So we really wanted to look at every potential option and how do we build that partnership? So um, we weren't able to immediately help them with the spring break, break situation as a sponsor, but our vendor was able to jump in and to provide thousands of additional meals. Um, I think we ended up getting 40 to 50,000 additional meals distributed through our vendors, kind of like a third party for the school during those spring break windows. And once we all got our bearings and, and kind of figured that out, and this year even, we're really looking at where are the days off? Um, where can we step in at our community sites to increase our distribution when the school needs to shut down? When there is no school, there is no distance learning. Um, how do we step in and fill that void to ensure that the meals that people have already come accustomed and need are continually going to be provided? So a lot of things that we did encounter um, were food shortages, which I feel like were very much a national issue. Um, the drastic increase of need and how quickly it came um, and the, the expected school closures, like I said, these were all huge things that we kind of had a balance in unison. Um, so we really tried to navigate what the schools were distributing, distributing for food and what was on their menus and then looking at our menus and trying to make sure that we still had um, a diverse option, that it wasn't the same thing every day or every week, that things were adjusting as much as possible. Um, that everything that we could get could be easily packed or pre-packed and advanced and then taken to the sites. Um, most of our materials that were brought to the sites were brought in two separate bags. We had a cold bag and we had a shelf storage bag. Um, and then every staff member would take one of each bag, put it into the bundle, and that would get distributed. Many of our sites did curbside. All of our recreation centers were doing curbside. Most of our libraries and neighborhood um, apartment spaces or mobile home agencies were doing curbside. So with that being said, they had tents, they had um, lines for hours. One of our sites, Conway Community Center, um, they run through the Senna Foundation and they have a massive block. I would say it's probably like six city blocks kind of combined into one big space because they have all this rec space um, and soccer fields and, and a garden. Um, and their line for meal would start at 12 or 12.30, so an hour to two hours before the meal distribution even started, and cars would be going around the block. So we had a very similar incident with, as Sherry did, where we had to work with local agencies to navigate the blockages that we were seeing from people lining up to get this food. Um, and some cars would have two families in it, because if they have a shared home and there would need to be a, a representative for each family, um, trying to mark those those contingencies and just making sure that there wasn't that double dipping standard happening. So there were so many factors that we had to take take into play. And through all of this of navigating that we had to navigate the changes of waivers of applications at hand um, and everything that was coming down from USDA. So I felt like, you know, maybe by the end of April, I had an idea of how I was operating and then came May and we didn't know what SFSP was going to look like and about two weeks before our summer program was supposed to start. So schools were gonna end and summer programming was gonna start for us. We were just getting guidance. So we really had to rush to figure out how do we get all of our, our applications for our sites, for our locations into our system so that they can be approved and that they can be operating in enough time so that no meals are missed. 
Um, and in that same duration, we um, in Minneapolis had um, George, George Floyd's murder. And so we had a lot of um, protests and riots that were happening that caused us and schools to shut down regardless, um, that we had to figure out how to get food to those agencies and out to the community, even during that time where large portions of our city were kind of being blocked off. So we had so many things kind of coming in and out all at the same time that were emotional, heavy, and then also just stressful because you have to figure out, okay, how does this waiver work in our state with our protocols and our established processes? How can we continue this distribution? Um, go ahead and slide. So with this, I wanted to provide uh, an aspect of a map. So this is just our St. Paul locations. Um, all of the blue dots are our recreation centers. So those are our eight locations that we distributed in St. Paul specifically. Um, those actually really came in hand during um, the time of our riots and our protesting because they were just far enough away from a lot of the incidents that they could amplify what they were providing. And a lot of the food from those shutdown locations were able to be funneled through them. Um, so we are very grateful for their staff and their capacity to assist during that time. And then we also have the green dots, which are more neighborhood centers. Um, those are um, large complexes of apartments that a lot of people live in, and usually the food was distributed in the parking lot to those that live in the building, um, so that no one had to go into the heavy, heavily populated building that they could be still outside under tents and under secure spaces. And then we have our two purple locations, um, that are YMCA neighborhood homes. So we partner with the y YMCA during our summer processes. And these two locations really amped up their ability to help serve the St. Paul area and districts um, as they were finding out that the school was running out of capacity for them as well. Because we're in five different counties, we literally work with probably like 11 different school districts minimum. Um, so we really had to navigate multiple school districts every single week, every um, every month we were navigating what is their capacity, where can we stand, and what does that look like. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Oops, slide, maybe. Oh, there we go, thank you. Um, so meals distributed. So this is the course um, of April through August. These are the numbers that we have most up to date of just our rec centers alone. So amongst these rec centers, we served over 680,000 meals during that month capacity. You'll see Conway in the middle really peaks up close to that 180,000 meals. Um, they were also able to work with um, Second Harvest Heartland um, and the Sheridan Story to get additional meal options to their community because their need was so intense in that neighborhood that they were able to get like additional fresh fruit. We were working with grocery stores to get their distribution there. Um, so it really helped each location get additional resources from their community to also distribute in addition to the bundles and to the meal bags provided through CACFP or SFSP. Um, the majority of our sites listed here, on average, we're serving 5,600 meals a week. Um, you'll see that MLK, uh, the second to last, uh, they were only serving one day a week versus the other sites were all serving two days a week. So there's a lot of variation. Um, but most of them were serving about 5,600 meals each week um, throughout that entirety. Um, so they really had to amp up their storage, their distribution. They had a really great chain of command that operated from fridge to car, from fridge to car. Um, and seeing that was really powerful. So to give you an idea of the, the increase, in 2019, Conway served 180,000 meals in an entire year they served 180,000 meals and in the course of five months they served 180,000 meals. Um, it same goes for many of the rec centers. Traditionally the majority of these rec centers listed were only serving between 30 and 45,000 a year um, and they were all at least doubling. So the need was there, the distribution was there, and thanks to those waivers the accessibility was so much easier to get to. People felt more comfortable coming one day a week to get those meals um, and they could go to the place closest to them because they had the bus stops coming near their zone and then they had the rec centers or the community centers or the youth serving organizations where they could go and pick up those meals as well. Um, and we really tried to make sure that that collaboration continued through that time frame. Um, slide. 
So how have we continued that support? So as COVID-19 continues, we're still waiting on those vaccines and the school year has started and hopefully we really see the progression of more of these waivers coming through and extending through next September. Um, but how are we gonna continue that? So for Youth Prize, we've really been looking at, we actually have a meeting tomorrow with our school districts and cities of deciding how we're gonna help during extended closures or holidays. How are we gonna be able to amp up? How can our vendor assist? Um, in additional capacities and distribution during those times? Do we have to do another model where they opt into the vendor in a specific time, or are we able to just increase at the sites that are already under our jurisdiction to distribute a higher amount? Um, what neighborhood locations can continue to increase meal distribution? Um, something that we've done is we've been fundraising a lot to get more coolers, more dry storage. Um, as I said, like the, the meals come directly to our locations and then they distribute them. Um, and we're needing additional coolers. We need those additional storage capacities. So we've been really working on getting that to them. So as their increased need keeps going up, they have that storage space and they have that ability. Um, and then we're able to coordinate with the schools again on if we're serving after school meals or if we need to serve breakfast and lunch, depending on what their capacities have been. Um, and another thing that we've had to consider is, is there enough staffing to match the continued need? Um, we've really lucked out in the rec centers that they've had ample amount of staff to supply during those windows that keeps our, um, our chain of command and our operations running. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, and it's just been really beneficial for all of us to have another way to support the community since they weren't able to come into buildings, they weren't able to go to their programming, and it, it provided another step of check-in, of seeing how everyone is doing, of just doing a brief like drive-by in the van where you get to see the people that you usually have program with. Um, it was really, really important for a lot of those staff to be able to come back and help support those meals. So I just really wanted to reiterate like without the waivers coming in, this work would not be as instrumental as it has been. With the thousands upon thousands of meals we've been able to distribute over the past five months, the change and the assistance we've been able to provide for our communities, I think is immeasurable. It's, it's changed so much of our operations in our partnerships in these communities and our collaborative abilities to support them in new ways that we didn't know possible. Um, and having a stronger connection with our school districts has really helped with that. So I just want to say thank you to No Kid Hungry for letting us on here. And um, it was really great to share with everybody. Thanks so much, Krista. There's been so much great information on this webinar. Um, I just have to give props to the three speakers um, and sharing your information, your expertise. Um, it's been fabulous. While we wait for questions to come in, we have just a few minutes. Um, folks, if you do have questions, again, uh, put those in the Q&A box. But I can kick us off. I have a question. Um, the coordination that you all do is so impressive, especially in a pandemic. I'd love to know quickly um, from each of you, um, and Amanda, I'll start with you, just some best practices in communicating with your sites, but also in coordinating with the schools. Sure. Um, so again, I, I think um, if, if we've learned anything um, during this time, it's that we really just need to be prepared in the event of another emergency. We never know what, what could happen, right? And so, um, so as far as communication is concerned, we, I, I think just establishing those, those strong partnerships, um, I just want to reiterate like the importance of that and just being in constant communication, letting them know what's happening even at times where you may not have an active partnership i think i think that um we were able to we caught wind the friday prior to schools closing that they were going to close that following monday and within with less than in less than 24 hours we had already established 17 food sites ready to launch on monday because of just that um the, the partnerships that we had formed and just staying in communication and, and keeping them informed of what's going on. Sherry, go ahead if you'd like to add. Oh, Sherry, you're on mute. I know. Okay, I was having a problem getting off mute. Um, so um, our teams uh, talk to each other through Microsoft Teams. Um, so we have a 
we created a team uh, so that we can share documents and schedule meetings and do all of those kinds of things. Um, and of, of course, with the school system, we're active partners. I talk to them every day. Um, and the superintendent sits on our board of directors. So we have a um, very strong relationship. I mean, just pick up the phone and call them, which we do often. Um, and I would even add to that. So um, for us, we have, for our site, since we are unaffiliated, we're not in that same space. We're not in those locations necessarily. Um, we use like Google Teams to our advantage. We have an online reporting portal. Um, and then we also use Slack. So we get a lot of notifications like as they need it, whoever has access to that. Um, it's been really integral. And with uh, schools and our other partners, it's been, they've become speed dial buddies or like I have an immediate Zoom link to connect with people when we need to. So it's, it's really just been able to have that quick response team of knowing like, hey, if I, if I email you this, it's I need it quickly. And um, they're on that same page. So they're, they're ready to reciprocate that, that assistance. Nice. And with that, we are out of time. We filled all our time with great information. Amanda, Sherry, and Krista, I can't thank you enough for um, making the time to tell us about your programs and all the great work you have been doing and continue to do. Um, Chelsea, can you go to the very last slide? I'm just gonna end with uh, reminding people to send us your stories, send us your questions, let us know how we can help. Um, and if you think of something after the webinar, feel free to send something um, to that email and we will get back to you. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe out there.